Hello and welcome to Views for the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and M&A in Canada. My name is Mario Negro, and I'm a partner in the Private Equity and M&A Group at Stegman Elliott. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome Colin Walker and Stephen A. Colin and Stephen are Managing Directors at Crosby & Company. Colin, Stephen, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thanks for having us, Mario. We're delighted to be here. Thanks, Mario. We always start our podcast by learning a little bit about our guests. And so I'd like to start by learning a little bit about you two. And if you can tell our audience a bit about yourselves and then obviously talk a little bit about Crosby. I mean, Crosby's got a rich history in our marketplace as an advisor. It's been a market participant for many, many years. So it's got a great story. Sure. So I'll kick it off. Colin Walker speaking. I've been with Crosby since 1991. So I've lived most of the history of Crosby. And Crosby was probably the first boutique M&A firm in the country formed by Alan Crosby, who was at Wood Gundy back in the 70s. And he had an entrepreneurial itch and decided to lead to form a firm that would provide sophisticated advice to private companies. And they made a big splash. And then that business got acquired by Merrill Lynch. And three years later, Merrill Lynch decided to leave Canada and Alan formed the current legal entity. And then I joined in 91. So certainly the firm has seen a lot of cycle, but when I joined, we were almost completely corporate finance oriented and it was a distressed market. We were doing a lot of restructuring work, pretty fancy deals and bring capital in from the United States, which was a kind of a new idea in the private company world. And that market went on for probably about five years. People won't remember this, but it was after the free trade agreement. So there were a lot of things that got restructured and needed to be fixed in the economy broadly. But after a few years, the capital started to flow back in, the border started to open up. And so then we sort of returned to our roots. If you were to look at the business today, where we're still doing both corporate finance and M&A, but we're probably 75%, just to pick a number, M&A advisory work, but we're a full suite firm. We do mostly private M&A work. We do a little bit of public work and we cover the whole beachfront. You know, we'll do some buy side work, buyouts, a little bit of restructuring. We get hired as consultants. We do some pretty funky deals. I mean, last year we sold a mature venture capital portfolio. We haven't really done that before, but we took it to the secondary market and it was really interesting and it was successful. And I guess the other two parts of our business today were EMD, so we raised capital, really kind of focused on the risk capital part of the balance sheet, and it's through the private placement market. And that's a bit opportunistic, usually triggered by distress or underperformance or a buy side situation. And then we have also an advisory component to our business, which is really, I think it's a differentiator for us. So we'll take on different kinds of projects where independence and capital market expertise is required. That started off really as a valuation business. We started doing shared opinions and formal valuations for boards and special committees of public companies, but it's kind of spilled over pretty heavily into the private part of our world. Anyway, that's a smaller part of our business, but it's different than one of our competitors. So that's a little bit about the firm. Steven, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, for sure. Steven Ng, I'm a managing director here, newest member of the Crosby team. My investment banking career has mostly been with bulge bracket firms in New York, Hong Kong, and Toronto, in addition to some experience in private equity and as an operator. But what's probably most relevant to your audience, this being a mid-market podcast, is I've had a chance to work with entrepreneurs and founder-led businesses of all shapes and sizes in different industries and countries all around the world. And the great thing about my role here at Crosby is I get the chance to advise our clients on a range of strategic situations beyond just the typical sell side or buy side mandates. So as an example, we have a mandate right now advising a client here in the consumer and retail industry on finding a joint venture partner in China and establishing a joint venture to enter into that market in addition to a growth equity raise. So a mandate and an assignment that may seem a little atypical for a firm of our size, but that gives you a bit of a flavor of what Colin alluded to and some of the interesting projects that we're up to currently in the market. One of the things that you know, makes Crosby so unique, I think, Colin and Stephen, you reiterated it is, whereas other advisors of the market, they only focus on one thing. Crosby's has had a, a rich history and really been great at a multiple places in the market. Yeah, you, know, you really have a strong brand for being reflective of all the elements of the mid market. And so, you know, it leads me to ask you a bit about what you're seeing, what you're working on, especially given your diverse practice. I want to get a sense from you both, what you're seeing in the market right now, what you're working on, busy areas you see kind of less so, and just get your perspectives on what you're seeing right now. 
Yeah, a couple of comments there. I mean, first of all, as you know, in the mid market here in Canada in particular, you do have to be a bit of a jack of all trades, right? And every client has unique circumstances, situations and problems that they're trying to solve and growth objectives. And so that really is the value of Crosby in that we really don't have a one size fits all, right? We take a very high touch, customized approach, to the type of advice we give our clients. Everything from traditional M&A advice to capital raising and other strategic opportunities. And so to that end right now, notwithstanding the obvious gloom and doom type of commentary out there in the marketplace, the reality is with a lot of our clients right now, they're somewhat immune to debt financing, for example. Their activities are not completely reliant on leveraging up and taking on debt to pursue growth opportunities. So we're seeing continued activity in consolidation in certain industries that private equity is dealing with. And we're still seeing opportunities with companies that have something unique and are somewhat, I'll call it recession resistant, but they just have great businesses, clean balance sheets, and are still looking at this opportunity to be opportunistic with what's happening in the marketplace. So in terms of industries, we're working on situations in the technology sector to traditional manufacturing, agriculture, food and beverage. So it's a pretty wide range of industries, but I think the common thread is that they are generally higher quality businesses, especially in this market right now. Buyers are gravitating upwards in terms of quality and being more discerning. Due diligence processes are taking slightly longer now because folks are looking into areas that they may not have in the past. So that's a bit of what we're seeing. And Colin, you have some perspectives as well on some of the files you're looking at. Yeah. Further to Stephen's comments, we're a high mix shop. We're not a sausage factory. We seem to do a lot of things, but in reality, they boil down to some core areas of competence. We look for good businesses. We like to work with good people. And I would say, even though we're dealing with businesses across different industries at any point in time, we would like to think that they're high quality businesses. We believe that they have the ingredients to do the transaction that we're trying to orchestrate. We're pretty hands-on as a group. We're detail-oriented. We pour ourselves into our clients' problems. And we also have fun. We like doing what we do. So that actually helps an awful lot. Because we're not focused on particular industry segments, as some of the firms that we compete with out of the States are, we've learned to be very quick studies of different types of companies and industries. I think we're all really strong at doing that. And that's really helpful in terms of servicing value and making the case for our clients in the market. So we're triangulating between what we see in the businesses and our understanding of what's going on in the capital markets, either buyers as an M&A or in fundraising if we're trying to raise capital. If things have those ingredients, we'll take on different types of situations like that. You know, right now, actually, one of our clients is a very successful architectural firm, and it's got a succession problem. It's got, you know, a lot of shareholders, and they are looking to try to catalyze some changes in their shareholder structure. So it's an M&A deal, but it's a different kind of M&A deal. A lot of the people are in that business are not going anywhere and don't want to go anywhere. And it happens to be a business that is very active outside of the country. So the process is very international. I think almost all the buyers for that business were abroad and they were all trade buyers, strategic buyers. I could tell you other stories of clients that wanted to do a deal, but they only wanted to go to the private equity marketplace or had reasons to only go to the private equity marketplace. So we can run a process that is completely different than the architectural one to suit the situation. And that's part of, I think, the value of the sort of flexible high mix. I wanted to ask you both, I mean, by the middle market still busy. There's still a lot of activity going. Sounds like you're confirming mm -hmm. that you had mentioned the high quality companies are still transacting. They still want to do stuff. Sounds like you're reiterating that. I want to get your perspective in terms of where you're seeing sellers are at, processes, activity, your perspective on what you're seeing out there in terms of who's transacting, who's buying, who's selling, because we're seeing the middle market still be active and want to get your perspective on what's happening on the ground. Well, first of all, a perspective on the sell side. I think I spent about half my professional career waiting for the demographic wave to come. And we've talked about this in the past, Ariel, like, yeah, 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 we're are all, about... what are all these uh, people going to sell their businesses? Well, I just happened to see some fresh stats over the last few days. And I thought it was really interesting in that the number of SMEs in Canada is estimated to be about a million. Now that includes businesses of a lot of a wide range of size. But the second 
part of the analysis was that about 60% of them are owned by baby boomers. And so that would suggest that we're going to see a continued supply of deals from the succession driven part of the marketplace. I think we're certainly seeing that. We've been seeing it for the last few years, and there's been kind of some indications that there's a bit of a slowdown going on over the last couple of quarters. I'm not sure we've really felt that yet. Now we're a small sample size, but you know, I'm personally optimistic that we're going to see a decent mid-market M&A kind of market for some time. And I'll give you some perspectives on the buy side, which is the opposite side of the coin. The buy side is not typically an area where we would historically be super involved with, but recently we've taken on two, I would say, very high quality buy side advisory mandates where we're helping super solid, high quality, well-capitalized mid-market companies looking to be aggressive and looking for targets. In one case, it's a little bit broader in terms of trying to find high quality targets to acquire. In another situation, it's a very targeted type of target they're looking at. So the fact that we have buyers in the mid-market that feel confident enough to be aggressive and outwardly looking for deals, to your point, Mario, to your question about activity levels, I think it's a clear sign of strength. I think underpinning that is mid to large size corporates are all using M&A as part of their strategic playbook. They're looking at the world as a lower growth place and M&A is a way to add some growth. And so it feels like we're having more of those kinds of conversations on people that are interested in the buy side. Just to put this into perspective, probably three quarters of our mandates right now are on the sell side. So we're actually very active in the market these days and we're getting very well received by the corporate world. I think the private equity world, I wouldn't say this is anecdotal, but it feels like they're being a little more cautious for obvious reasons. I mean, people are wondering about valuations dip late last year in the private equity world, if you look at the numbers, but the fresh numbers for Q1 show that they actually rebounded again. But anyway, you got questions around valuation. Obviously, debt service is an issue with higher interest rates. The banks are being more cautious. So they're feeling their way along. But, you know, there's a lot of dry powder in the private equity world. And, you know, there's no indication yet that fundraising slowed down a whole lot. So I think good fundamentals on the buy side. Yeah. And if you're a good buyer right now is the buyer's market, certainly, right? In terms of less competition, larger corporate carve outs, being a little bit more realistic, picking off portfolio companies from private equity firms that may not be in the best shape and just generally being a little bit more opportunistic in this type of market. We're seeing lending also be strong in Canada, which I know given the U.S. experience, American banks are on the side, but given what you're working on and and the broad type of work that Crosby does, you get visibility in seeing what lenders are doing and whether it's on the sell side. But we seem to see in your perspective, what we just seen on the lending side, it seems to be that I think you said it best, calling they're cautious, they're a little, you know, they're asking more questions, but they seem to be active. Even yeah. to admit market companies, they're not afraid. I mean, they're sharpening the pencils a little more, but I don't want to get your perspective on where you see the lenders in the middle market right now. Well, we've heard some harrowing stories out of the U.S. where a lot of the lenders pulled to the sidelines. And I think it started before Silicon Valley and, you know, the sort of the banking problems, but I heard a story of a group that was looking to finance an acquisition and I think 20 of the groups that they went to wouldn't submit a bid. That was a U.S. private equity anecdote that I just heard this week at the ACG conference, which kind of shocked me. I think the Canadian banks are open for business. There are some signs that they're being a little more cautious. And I think with the provisioning that we're seeing in the banking results this week, that's a signal that things are going to be a little tighter here. But people can get their deals done. And the indications are that leverageability in terms of multiples of EBITDA, like senior debt, it's down a bit, but there's still room to maneuver. And the private equity groups, I think, are putting in a little more equity to get the deals that they like done. And they're probably thinking that they could recap these things in a year or two if rates go down and then they've locked up a good business. So that may be kind of a smart stretch. But I think it also gets to quality. I think if you have a really good business in today's market, I don't think you have any problems getting a transaction done at a value that is close to what it would have been, I'm going to say, 18 months ago for many industries. Like it's not true in maybe in certain parts of tech, but in many industries. The B and the C quality assets, however, those ones might be a little tougher. I think there's a real premium on preparation and a good sale process in this environment as well. Like you better have done your homework well as the banker 
and make sure you understand what you're taking to market and what the issues are going to be and hopefully have your analysis and arguments prepared in advance. Can I ask you, Crosby has such a great reputation in capital raising your story. Like you are a firm who's really been a strong firm when it comes to helping clients with capital raising. I'm curious, given the market that we're in, are you still seeing people looking for capital? Are you still able to find capital? Like, is capital for the middle market still available? As you point out, maybe it is in the sense of the high qualities, but what's your feeling in terms of capital providers or people when it comes to capital raising? Is it an option right now or is it kind of like hold off and wait till things clear up? Yeah, I mean, look, there's certainly no shortage of people looking for capital. In terms of capital providers, it's sort of what we touched upon earlier, right? Investors are going to be incredibly discerning about where they're willing to deploy. There's always credit available at a certain price. And that's sort of what it comes down to a little bit right now, right? How stuck are companies and what sort of terms are you willing to give up in this environment? I would say for growth equity, the world still is, notwithstanding the pullback and rise in rates, there still is a lot of dry powder, not just in the private equity world, but other institutional pockets of capital globally. That's really kind of the lens that I always look at is what's kind of happening globally. And there's still a lot of money out there. And there is an opportunity if you're in the right sectors in a business that has the right attributes that folks are looking for internationally, there can be a window to position yourself to access capital. Steve, Colin, you live and breathe the middle market. So I'm going to ask you the crystal ball question because you are active participants. You plan these things for where this market's going to go. What are your sense of where you see the market going from a middle market perspective as active participants? Or where do you see this market going? Let me take a stab at it. And then Stephen, you can give your two cents. There's a lot of moving parts out there in the economy. So I think there are lots of reasons to be cautious. I feel like the sentiment changes, not necessarily from week to week, but maybe from months to months. All the concerns about recession notwithstanding, we haven't really seen any major tangible signs of it. Although I think most Betty people would say we will have a recession, but how deep will it be? Will it be more of a technical recession? Will the real estate market hold up or will we have a route that spills over into other sectors? I mean, those are all things that you could debate and we need a lot more time to really to cover that ground properly. But personally, I think there are a lot of drivers in the M&A market that we've already discussed here. There are needs of both buyers and sellers that even if we have kind of a bit of a downturn, we're going to continue to have decent activity because certainly the succession marketplace, there are people that will have a need to sell. And I think there's a lot of people out there, frankly, who are going to run out of time. And we see this in our conversations out there, people that have waited a long time, arguably too long to really get started. They don't seem to realize that it takes a year to sell a company properly in most cases. And then there are some entanglements for another year or two afterwards. And so if you're starting at 70, ouch. But anyway, I think activity is not going to stop. There's going to be an M&A market. A lot of the concern around valuations may already be baked into the market. Certainly in the public markets, that's what some people think. So I'm optimistic. I think the next year could be choppy, but I think, again, for good companies, if you do it properly, you're going to be able to get a decent outcome in a process. I think there are some people that have pulled back. They want to wait and see. I mean, we have seen a little bit of that. But on the other hand, we've got other people that are just saying, no, I'm not going to wait. I'm going. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, I think one of the most important factors is that the rate of change in a host of market and economic conditions has slowed a little bit. Last year, we saw one of the fastest rise in interest rates, dramatic pullback in liquidity, rapid decompression in valuations. And that all happened within a span of call it nine to 12 months. It feels like the market has settled a little bit. And that's one of the most important factors for business owners and other decision makers to form a view and take action and steps. So like Colin, I'm optimistic for the second half of the year, mainly because of that. You know, you can plan around it. It's not making a call on where rates are going to be or whatnot. I think it's more that any rate of change in a host of important market conditions are going to be a little bit more stable. And that's going to be helpful to the mid-market and the market at large for M&A deals. Stephen, Colin, I want to thank you for joining us. It was great to have you be on our podcast with the history and all that you do in the marketplace. You're the real middle market. So it's your perspective is super valuable. I'm excited to hear Colin that you're positive about the future because if you're positive, then I'm positive. So thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate having your input and tell us a little bit about Crosby and yourselves. Thanks for having us, Mara. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mara.